Howdy do, and welcome to Roleplay Geeks. I'm your host, Frank. I'm your token hippie, John. I'm your favorite Jim, Jim. This is Steve. And this is Steve-O, a.k.a. The Other Steve. In this week's episode, we're going to talk a little bit about our experiences playing Root. Uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about some cool stuff we may have found. I ran across this two items that are kind of linked, and I rather like this as a GM. And the first is uh, this world building toolkit that somebody has created a Kickstarter for. And, and, and it's kind of nifty because it is a, a flow chart, really, on how to build your worlds. Now, as a GM, this is the part that I find the most fascinating and uh, intimidating. Well, not the most intimidating. I get out of control really quickly when I'm making my worlds. And I think that having this world building toolkit, which kind of takes you through the process of how to think about your world and how to construct your world in a meaningful way would be pretty cool. I mean, you other guys, you guys, what do you, how do you approach building your worlds? D do you think about it much or, you know, do you need something like a toolkit? So for me, usually, I just uh, build what I need as I go. Uh, so I, I don't, I know a lot of guys love getting into, you know, creating an entire world or in my case, most of the things that I create are, uh, are for traveler and yeah, I'll probably usually just basically rely on your stuff. You did like, you know, 30 years ago, <laughs> I do, but I, sometimes I have to add to it. And it usually, I mean, I have kind of a cluster of worlds and then if I have a new adventure that needs a new world, I'll, I'll uh, get into that because I discovered that if you can get too detailed, it can drag the adventure down because I want to show everybody all this cool stuff I created. So although I'd be interested in looking at the, this tool, it still could be useful. What, what, what is it called? It, it's a, it's a paper product really well, PDF product, but it's also got some tables that allow you to kind of roll this stuff up, but they have this flow chart that kind of shows that things like geography and population and history and all these things are, are intermingled. So you need to think about them a little bit and it kind of takes you through a, a flow chart step-by-step -step of think about this, think about this, think about that. And my interpretation of what I've read is that it isn't, you don't have to get down to the nitty gritty details. You can just sort of approach this from a, let me just think about this as like one line statement, you know, about this aspect or that aspect or the other aspect, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah. Where can you find that? Uh, it's a Kickstarter and uh, it is just, I, I'm a little confused whether it was just completed or about to be completed. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive to get a hold of. I think it was like, I think it's on drive going to be on drive through our uh, PG and it's called the world world builder toolkit. Uh, and it's put out by, uh, hold on, uh, uh, shield dice, shield dice, shield ice. I don't know. They use the D over again. They, they, they use the D as double duty. So it's shield and dice with, but with one D <laughs> studios, shield uh, ice, shield ice, I guess is how you say it. Uh, shield ice studios, world building toolkit. And, uh, it, it, it it's it, it was kind, it was a neat find that I had. And then related to that, I found another uh, uh, thing that I, I really like, which is this massive book called Spectacular Settlements. And it, it is basically a book of how to create settlements. Uh, now, it's got a very heavy D&D uh, &D type fantasy focus, but... Uh, settlements are one of those things that I think are really nifty and rife for a lot of exploration as a, as a gamer and as a GM, but we don't tend to put as much time into them uh, that, that as I would like personally, as both a gamer and a GM thinking about what, you know, what type of village is it, what type of town, how do they run and all that sort of stuff. This is just kind of a book that, that has a bunch of them. And also has a good process for just dynamically rolling them real quick. And they, and they encourage you to sort of take the rolls as is and deal with the headaches and kind of, again, like the world builder toolkit, kind of think it through a little bit with a one sentence descriptor. It's kind of nifty. <laughs> I just see how our games would roll with that because it would be, you guys are like that. When we go into a village, you start asking silly questions sometimes like, um, 
what's the political system? What's the, uh, who's in charge? And I guess that's pretty normal. But then you go into like details and stuff. So that'd be fun for me because I'd just be sitting there. Who's in charge? Hold on. Roll. Uh, a guy named Doug. <laughs> what's the political system? Uh, roll. Uh, well, Doug's Doug. not in charge. This other guy who's a bouncer, his name is uh, Carl. He's in charge. Why is everybody named Doug and Carl in this game? Well, because that table only has two choices. <laughs> I don't know. That could be fun for me. A little levity and a little bit of the stress off. Only fitting. So that's interesting because on the past two weeks of recording for Game Mastery, we're talking about building campaigns. And the purpose of it is to help me build a campaign. And I'm using the first part of that for our upcoming OVA adventure playtest. And I'm using a system in that that a guy has online that's a 5 by 5 grid where you create your encounters for a broader adventure to kind of lay it out basically. And I would have loved to look at the world builder toolkit to see what it offered because of what I'm currently doing in that for our upcoming game for Roleplay Geeks. And the settlement one, I really, really like the idea of that because I'm kind of stuck at the moment on settlement part because uh, the settlements in this game are going to, for you guys, are going to play a big role in the two or three sessions we're going to do. So I'm really looking forward to looking at those two links that you're bringing up. So I just checked um, Drive Through RPG. Apparently, it is not available as of now. But maybe if you're listening to this in the future, downstream it'll be there. But I did run across another world building uh, tool that was only like five dollars, so that looked pretty cool. I didn't read about it a lot, but it said if you need a quick world, here you go, and it had all kinds of land masses and stuff. So five bucks. Yeah, checking the news item, I conflated the two. My fault. Uh, yeah, it is not available on our uh, drive through RPG, and we're not exactly sure when it will be on the World Builder Toolkit, but the other one is. Now I am sad. It was a Kickstarter, and uh, so it is going to go out soon because the Kickstarter is over, so it'll be available. And it uses our favorite D6 uh, to do its world building in the toolkit. Right on. I think you were being sarcastic with the favorite D6 comment. A little bit. So, is any, anybody else run across anything interesting this week? I ran across an article. You know, I'm a big uh, Chaosium fan, as well as Call of Cthulhu and that sort of stuff. So, there was a little-known board game that was out in the late 1970s. It was actually Chaosium's, I think, their third release. They, of course created RuneQuest, which was released in... Um, actually, their first release was something called White Bear and Red Moon, which I don't know what that is. And they re released RuneQuest, of course, in 1978, where they also, in 1978, released a board game called Lords of Middle Sea. And it is a post-apocalyptic game. Now, this is the original version. Mm -hmm. It was a post-apocalyptic board game that takes place in 2401 and the world is flooded over with all this catastrophic flooding i guess kind of like the movie water world it's all steam powered kind of a steampunk kind of theme and the characters on it would explore uh islands and either by ship or by airship it was uh announced that chaosium is actually going to release this setting post-apocalyptic setting as a role-playing game uh there is no release date on it yet i never really thought that water world would be a setting that i'd want to play in and at first i was like okay there's gonna be a ton of kevin costner jokes uh but the more i think about it as i'm sitting here i'm going well that would be kind of interesting particularly with the flying you know the blimps and stuff like that yeah yeah so i was trying to get to the part Hang on a second. Who was that bad guy in, in Waterworld? What was it? Dennis? Dennis Dennis Hopper. Hopper. Yeah. yeah the, Dennis the bad Hopper. guy of every 90s movie ever, you know. Well, he was also one of the two people along with Peter Fonda that was in Easy Rider. So just a little bit of movie <laughs> trivia and motorcycle trivia. <laughs> 
for all, for all of our viewers. That. You know what? I'm just going to 70 edit and that above part out. <laughs> <laughs> it was totally. Yeah. You'd be, you'd be surprised when I edit these things, how much of my own. No one. The Venn diagram of gamers and motorcyclists, I don't imagine, has a lot of overlap. Uh, yeah. Hey, there's a good reason to write into roleplaygeeks.com. If you are a gamer and a motorcyclist, a brother in the wheel and the dice, then email me. Let me know. So, anyway, back to this uh, Middle C game. So, they say, you know, it's going to use the basic role play system, which they have. It's kind of their house rules uh, that they use in RuneQuest and Call of Cthulhu, although now I realize there's some differences between those two rules. They said this is going to be a stripped down version of the basic role play system, which I can't imagine it being much more stripped down than Call of Cthulhu, but regardless um you players will control adventurers traders explorers and other characters surviving the world ravaged by nuclear war and natural disaster the party will have a ship that they can customize and use to travel the ruined earth seeking out isolated settlements on dots of remaining land or the last remnants of technology hidden away in underground bunkers so there will be a core rule book and then an adventure source book and future supplements are planned, but there's no release date yet, so we'll keep our eye on that one. Lords of Middle Sea. Definitely sounds neat. We know how you love the uh, post-apocalyptic thing, so. Oh yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah. If we're done with that, I've got a a small news item, putzing around on the web this week, and I saw this rumor going around about Hasbro selling off Wizards of the Coast. And after looking into it a little bit, it seems like it's entirely a rumor. I mean, I guess it got started by Cos Hasbro at the end of the year, decided to sell off a bunch of different properties. But there's no mention of Wizards of the Coast. And Wizards of the Coast has enjoyed year over year growth with um, both Magic the Gathering, which is their number one earning property, and then also with Dungeons and Dragons, double digits uh, in terms of profit. So that seems to be entirely a rumor, but it's an interesting thing to talk about, I guess, because it's uh, making its rounds through all of the different channels and podcasts out there. You know, I think it's one of those things that um, that company does so well, Wizards of the Coast, that I can't imagine that if it sold to someone else, it would do anything differently. Uh, here's a fun fact. Hasbro owns Death Row Records. I mean, so we're talking about... A, yeah, I know. This is one of the things you just go, what? But they actually own Death Row Records. And um, <laughs> so we're talking about a company that's so large, you know, that it's constantly, obviously, adding to uh, its its portfolio. And we think of Hasbro just as the toys. But, I mean, obviously, they're doing lots of different things. So, you know, they're probably constantly shuffling that stuff around a little bit. I can't wait till they have crossovers and you can pull the little, sorry, just Steven, you can pull those little strings on the toys and have some of the music from Death Row Records come out of it. I would buy that. <laughs> of course you would. I've seen your nice. son's room. It's got the, some well, of the scariest crap in the world in there. Maybe it'll help increase those double digit profits you were talking about, that 90 bucks that uh, they, I didn't understand what you were saying there. Was that just a mistake? No. A funny thing. Uh, when I heard that, too, from the person, I'm like, double-digit problems? What are you talking about? I mean, I, I can go out and most my neighbor's yard for 20 bucks. I mean, I'm in the double-digit. No, it's a percent of um, percent profit. So it's in the 10 to 20% profit range, net profit. Oh, okay. So they're, they're valuable information for those of us who don't think in percentages i suppose <laughs> yeah I, I probably should have mentioned that because i had to look it up too i'm like what that that's okay that's okay i was just gonna say unless hasbro was really strapped for cash i can't imagine them selling off probably one of their most profitable facets of their business it would be I, most i don't likely, know i think my I little mean, pony is probably the bet most really i i don't know i mean i don't really know you know hasbro is a bit like disney in that, again, they own lots of things that you don't even realize they own. So, for all I know, Death Row Records is the most profitable. <laughs> for Actually, all I know. 
Well, I just maybe it's not their most profitable, but obviously in this past year, role playing games have seen a big surge in Dungeons and Dragons controls over half of the market. I mean, Wizards of the Coast. So uh, with that kind of growth, typically a large corporation wouldn't dump something that's making them money unless they were really strapped for cash. Typically, they would dump something that's less profitable just to you know, lay off employees, so on and so forth. That, that way, the stock price, their overall stock price would jump up if they got rid of a non-profitable, an unprofitable f- segment of their, of their business. That's all I'm saying. So I would be surprised myself. So I've got a couple of items, uh, one of which is a game that I never wanted made into a role-playing game is being made into a role-playing game. And it seems that a lot of people are incredibly excited about this. And that is Talisman, the board game. So Talisman came out in 1983, and it was something that was always kind of on the periphery of what I knew about and thought it sounded cool. It was bought by Games Workshop. And it is uh, Monopoly or Nerds and so D&D Nerds. And it has an end game that is so incredibly excruciating that it it just depresses me. So you end up playing one, two, three, four, five hours of back and forth and people stealing carts and amulets and things like that and going around the board and it's got so it's exactly like monopoly is what you're saying yes yes and you 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 build your character up and then all of a sudden you've got nothing and then you've got to go through like i said this excruciating end game that was so tedious that all kinds of people made different end games to replace it over the years and it just, it's one of those games that I love the idea of, but I, I never really liked the last third of any time that I played it. While well, they're making it a role playing game, a bona fide role playing game. So people are excited about that. Not people that I love, but uh, uh, people. Uh, maybe that was rude. Maybe that was rude. Yes, yeah, a little bit. Someone. was. Yeah, alienate half our audience. Um, Talisman sucks, but it. We lost great. Joe. Uh, what? We lost yeah, Joe. Much. Yeah. Half of our audience. It's damn it, damn it, Joe. Come, Come back. back, Joe. It didn't mean. Hey, it. Joe. Where are you going with that talisman in your hand? And I didn't just come on back. Come on back. So there's that, and then the most like joyous news that i heard this week on the nerd front joy 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 in my heart is that an actual song (laughs) you apparently have never been to a christian camp (laughs) oh no 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 i have not does he he look like tom hanks in 1980 (laughs) Hey, uh, you know, sorry about that, Stephen. Uh, please continue with your joyous news. Well, wait, wait, I want to cover the talisman thing just for a second before we jump to the next thing. Is mm-hmm. that so? Oh. I've never played this game, um, and and it strikes me that what makes a good board game and what makes a good role playing game are not necessarily uh, the same. So you know, you talked about the last third of Talisman being uh, problematic. Let's just call it that, right? Uh, but you don't really have that in a role-playing game. In theory, it just keeps going and going and going and going. There's no like end game per se. I mean, there is, but there kind of isn't. Um, so does Talisman make a good setting for stories as opposed to, you know, strategic, you know, back and forth that you sort of described? I, I don't think so. It's not quite like a gloom haven where you've got this story and system that evolves as you play. So you're given certain branches that fundamentally change the game and how your characters interact and how you feel about it. Because it is locations on the map and getting items to get to the center 
to either totally screw with whoever got there before you or to get to the crown of command before anyone else. So it's st it, it is still kind of like, you know, just a more complicated version of Monopoly. So you could say, oh, yes, yes, I remember the time that I was on Boardwalk and it was a beautiful day. And it doesn't work that way. Um, although I, I'm sure people would force it. I, I keep looking at the descriptions and I just, it just doesn't click with me. I, uh, I, I, I see people who love it and I don't understand. I don't understand. I really don't understand. Well, you know, last week we touched on a little bit about the difference between, you know, you buy, you buy the game, there's a new game and there's two elements. There is the rule set and then there's the, the setting. Uh, you know, I think most people purchase a game based on this, the setting or, you know, if it's based on a movie or a property, a novel or something like that. And, you know, just bringing that up makes me think of this setting for this new Chaosium game, for instance. And I'm part of me is like, why create a whole new game? And they admit they're going to use the basic role playing system. Why not make it a supplement for Call of Cthulhu? Um, I mean, because they want to publish a whole new game. I mean, I'm sure there'll be exclusive things there that will only work with this game because of a certain rule. But what do you guys think about that? Should somebody just create a whole new game or, or more supplements? So, you know, Jimmy's always said that he likes Traveler because he likes the things he can do with the rules, though he doesn't like all the rules. And and I'm kind of curious if there was a tr if there was a fantasy traveler using that rule set if it would be something that would appeal to him and and I suspect uh, both Stevo and Jimmy have both expressed they don't like fantasy as well as science fiction because it's all magic or whatever it's getting gold coins etc the sort of the motivations don't intrigue them as much for a storytelling uh, capability so. I, I think the interactive ability is important because I'm thinking about like the D20 version of Traveler. We never played the D20 version of Traveler. And I think part of that is because we just didn't get like the rules. I think we tried. Oh, do we once. even have, have the rules? Well, yeah, we had like a, we tried one time over at Frank's the D20 rules. We may have only gotten so far as to just create the characters. We were oh. looking at it, and uh, I think yeah. we made characters. I don't think we played, actually. Yeah, it was closer to, like, the 4th edition D&D. &D, so they, they admittedly kind of sucked anyway. So, I mean, you could do it if you were using GURPS Traveler, because the GURPS rule system, you can add or take away any part of it you want. I think if you were trying to do Traveler, or I'm sorry, if you were trying to do some type of fantasy-based game using the traveler rule set the biggest issue would be there's no magic system now there's psionics uh, and that's an optional rule of course you don't have to include telekinesis and telepathy and whatever you know psychic powers you may have that could i guess maybe kind of fit with that but when you look at it, the game is really designed to be a hard science um uh, setting uh, there's just no fantasy elements there's no magic weapons there's no all of that stuff now if you wanted to make um, a lost colony that uses swords and shields and melee weapons and that sort of thing and get rid of the magic just not have magic it's still hard science you could absolutely do it with traveler because all the rules are there so you kind of answered your own question in a way i mean you're, what you're saying is that you can't really separate out that setting from in the in the sense of the middle the the genre uh from the rule set in the case of traveler so i think that you'd find a similar situation in many sure. games right well basically i think the biggest issue is there aren't any you know like magical things there's no uh for traveler i mean there's there's no magic set except for the psionics so i mean you could kind of you know adapt that i guess into that um and then, you know, your monsters could be aliens, if you will. Uh, you know, you could kind of sit there and mold and, and kind of push things into it. Uh, I mean, I like Traveler's rule set. 
very simple rule set. It's just that character creation is, you know, is a pretty large stepping stone to get into the game. But <clears throat> then once you're in, you're kind of. I would I would love the character creation for a fantasy setting. I think that would be really cool. But that's aside. What What did you say you'd love it for? What a fantasy setting. I would love basically what they do for the traveler. You know, the two oh, yeah. page pages. Oh. You know, don't worry. When we do Rune Quest, you'll have exactly that. You'll see. Oh really? Oh yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. I thought I liked that. So, <laughs> this is my own fault because I got distracted. But I felt like I, I feel like I was walking down a, a dark forest road where the theme was how it sucks to turn Talisman into an RPG game. But up ahead, I could see a little clearing where there was some joyous news that I wasn't going to actually get to because somebody <laughs> come out of the forest, clubbed me in the back of the head, drug me off into the woods, and now I'm waking up in a, a clearing. I'm not sure where I am. <laughs> Jimmy getting distracted is not exactly... Uh, it's sort of synonymous. But it was implied by Jimmy. You know, just saying, Jimmy, it's implied. I want to go back but to the Steve, clearing with the joyous news. <laughs> so Stephen had a second news item. Let's do that. Shall I sing again first? Yes. Never mind. So as I'm in my clearing and this <laughs> guy who is damp and uh, unclothed stumbles in with a wild look on his face, muttering something about space and traveler, and he's got an empty vodka bottle in his hand. I Drink. said, would you like to hear some joyous news? And that news is on Star Trek Discovery. Okay? Okay. Stop. Spoiler alert. It's not, it's not, I, it's not I don't joyous. believe it's joyous. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm it's, out. It's... <laughs> Some of us aren't watching it and are planning to watch it someday. Yeah. Well. Yeah, but this, this is Steve's action move. You know, spoiler. I'm taking my headphones off. You don't have to take your headphones off. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I took my headphones off. <laughs> Discovery. So one of the cast members was thinking about how they've had to change everything so that they're further apart than they used to be and they don't have the interaction that they used to. They're in between seasons. They're starting work on season four. And so I guess sometime during season three, uh, Blue DeBario, uh, she plays a trill. She, well, no, no, let me rephrase that. She plays a human with a trill. There you go. She is the youngest. And... So she talks like this? <laughs> oh, nice. Now, isn't the trill the symbiote? Yes. Right, that lives inside yes. the body of, of the host, right? Oh, yes. we digress. Go ahead. Yes. Well, just... whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't, In case somebody out there is not a Star Trek fan. I thought they were the furry little things that multiplied. That's Tribbles. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not you a Star Trek fan. You got the first three letters right. <laughs> I'm not a Star Trek fan, so go ahead. Except there for the go. original. And Wrath of right was here. awesome. A purist. That's fine. Well, she is. she's the youngest and one of the newest cast members. And so she thought that it might be something they could do was to play D&D &D remotely. And it just so turns out that the newest character on the show, who's an Andorian, he is married to Ensign Sylvia Tilly, who's an engineer. So, uh, yeah, Mary Wiseman said, hey, my husband has just been learning how to DM. And it would be great. You know, if we maybe had him run a game for us. So he has been running a game. They've been being pushed along by Anthony Rapp, who plays. Uh... Steven just dropped out. We'll never know the end of the story. So this week, we're going to talk a little bit about our experiences with Root, the role playing game. And it's something we got to sit down and we did three sessions, I think on playing root or four i can't remember uh was it three or four uh but anyway we all got together and jimmy ran a little campaign uh, that we ran through now let's start off by talking a little bit about the rules and sort of a broad outline i'm gonna let uh, steve-o and jimmy take care of that because i think they covered the rules a little bit better than i did yeah Go so ahead. um 
Okay. <laughs> I'll go ahead Sorry. and f- fill in anywhere where I'm getting messing up or, or getting this wrong. So um, the game itself is built on the Apocalypse Engine, which is um, a set of rules, role-playing game mechanics, that is a little different from your typical kind of role-playing game like Dungeons & Dragons or Travelers or, or, or Call of Cthulhu. It's based entirely on classes and moves. So each class has a unique set of moves, and then all classes have a general set of moves that they can utilize when they're role-playing. So that essentially is the rule set. It's a very simple rule set, and it relies on um, the game master producing the the environment and giving them opportunity for the uh, players to utilize those moves in the game. The game master doesn't, and this is the weirdest part, the game master doesn't roll. So it's all based on the game master presenting the world like you would in any other role playing game, but then all of the um, all of the things that happen in the game are a response to uh, which moves are selected. And moves have basically three uh, possibilities, a, a success, a partial success, and a miss. And while the Game Master does get to choose exactly what those things mean, most moves come with a set of uh, results, whether it's a full success or a partial success or a miss, you'll have a list of results that are attached to each one of those. And then, Steve-O, am I missing something? Well, um, I thought that I would mention, I thought that I would mention that the... um, First of all, in case anybody doesn't remember, uh, Root is a game where you take the personification of a woodland animal. Uh, The species doesn't matter. Uh, You can pick whatever you want. It has no bearing in the game, if I'm not mistaken. But at least in the quick start rules, I chose a badger. Frank chose a rabbit. John was a fox, because we all know John's a fox anyway. And... uh, Jimmy was uh, the game master, so it was nothing. So, um, you know, that's the basis of it that I just wanted to remind everyone. It's very um, tongue-in-cheek in in a way, I guess. Very lighthearted, even though there was some gruesome stuff we dealt with. (laughs) Yes. So, so yeah, on the quick start, which is all that's available right now, um, there's a good paragraph here uh, once my dog stopped screaming. (laughs) So there's a paragraph here in the uh, quick start rules that give you a sense of um, what you're playing. Foxes, mice, rabbits, and birds. The woodland has many different kinds of denizens, but there are four primary species who've made the woodland their home. Foxes, mice, rabbits, and birds. None of them have essential qualities, traits true of all foxes or all mice, but they do have certain cultural qualities and ideals that they've uh, they have adopted. So you aren't uh, limited to foxes, mice, rabbits, and birds. You can pick any uh, animal. We had two badgers, a fox, and a bunny uh, in our group, which was a lot of fun. And then we had all kinds of NPCs from a moose to a hedgehog. So you get to choose all different kinds of animals, but none of those animals have... uh, any particular trait specific to them, like it said, you know, no essential qualities that have any gameplay mechanics to them. All game mechanics are really based on the moves uh, that come out of that apocalypse engine, game engine. After that, you essentially create one of six characters, which do have all these different moves. Um, The Arbiter, let's see. Do you have that list up, Jimmy? I do not, but I can bring it up really quickly. Um, Ranger, Vagabond, Tinker. Yeah, there's only a handful. The Scoundrel. Yeah. And I think that's it. Yeah, the Arbiter, th- Ranger, thief. Scoundrel, Thief, Tinker, and Vagrant. So they all have different you know, attributes, just like any other character class in any other game. And, of course, what they call it here is Moves. Um, when you roll up your character, there's some background information, what factions you come from, that sort of thing. So there's apparently, you know, a lot of politics involved in the woodland areas. Uh, isn't there like a cat empire or something? I don't, <laughs> I don't remember exactly, but you know, 
Yeah, so anyway, to wrap this, uh, at least the introduction of this thing up before we get too far off a of track here, um, in the setting, you're basically in the woodlands. The woodlands is made up of these interconnected meadows. The meadows are controlled by the different factions. There are two primary factions, the uh, Eerie, which are the birds, and the Marquis de Cat, which is the cat that has come in with all of this technology and stuff from a foreign land. And while there's a civil war going on with the Erie, the cats moved in and established a foothold. And then you have the denizens of the forest. The full game has a total of seven different factions. But for the quick start, we only had three. And we really didn't make any, didn't utilize any of the factions or the reputation part of the game. So that's essentially your setting going into it. And I'm going to leave it there, Frank. And also we should note this is based upon a board game originally. So... I suspect if you're familiar with the board game, those other factions and capabilities and stuff like that probably are going to inform the rest of the, the full role-playing game. I don't know that, but I'm guessing. Uh, so this, this quick start is just sort of a, a, a pared-down version of what's available. Um, I don't remember any rules for like leveling up or anything like that. Do you guys? Like, It seems like when you make your character, that's just who you are forever. But I, I don't. We didn't play enough for that to be relevant, but I don't remember anything about that. Yeah, there is a rules for leveling up once you've um, once you've achieved basically. I think it's your nature you have to achieve, or you have this goal. Every class or every character selects a goal that they have to achieve, and once you achieve that, then you um, get some additional moves, um, and then you come up with a new uh, new goal for your character. Right, and. One other thing to point out in creating your characters, um, all of your attributes, which are pretty self-explanatory, you don't roll any dice. So you basically begin at zero. Uh, depending on the class you pick, you might get a plus one or a plus two in certain things. And then when you choose your moves, you get three basic moves to start with. You may be able to increase an attribute through that as well. So I guess we're into the what do we thought of the game uh and i guess there's two ways to approach it one is the story and the setting and the other one of course is the rule set uh and let's start with the story and the setting i thought the story was interesting neat little little kind of one shot even though it was four shots technically or three shots uh but it was it was a neat little one shot i had a lot of fun with it i had um i don't think we really got very much taste of it to tell the truth a little bit we did because we just kind of went almost directly into, well, here's a problem, here we go. And we just went to the problem, dealing with stuff. And we kind of had fun doing the, kind of playing our characters as Fox, Badger, etc. But I don't know if we really got into the general, the whole overarching story of being either against or for this, you know, Marquis, Cat, and, and all this other fun so. So um, I found that, uh, you know, whenever we were just doing the um, the adventure started, just like any other role playing game, Jimmy set it up, said we needed to travel to a town to check out a problem, deliver a message, I think is what it was. And then when we got there and, of course, along the way, there was a journey. Um, interestingly, in this game, when you do exert yourself, um, you typically have four blocks of exhaustion. My character had five blocks of injury, but typically four blocks and then four blocks of decay. And so depending on what you do as you're playing the game, you would mark off one. So for instance, um, halfway through the journey, I saw something down a cliff and I had to climb down there to get it. And so Jimmy said, mark off one exhaustion. So I've only got, you know, four of these to use up in a day. So I have to think about that, you know, if I want to do this or that. And the only way to recover exhaustion is, is to rest, you know, so, um, those are those things. And you, I don't remember even rolling any dice for that. It was just a choice, right, Jimmy? Mm-hmm. Right. So, like I said, you know, we, we arrive in town. We find out there's a problem. Um, I enjoy the role-playing aspect of it quite a bit. Um, we just went around town, asked a lot of questions, uh, questioned all the different people, visited all the different places, and eventually started uncovering a mystery, explored a big tower, and took it from there. I found it to be the experience to be just like any other role-playing game other than we 
are playing um, woodland creatures and you keep that in the back of your mind. I know one of the funniest parts was um, we startled a possum and Jimmy as the game master had the possum, you know, at first the way he described it, we're like, this guy have a heart attack that he, you know, pass, pass it, you know, he looked like he died. And, and then we're like, Oh, he's playing possum. I get it. You know, and that, that wasn't in the rules. That was Jimmy, you know, winging it, but it was great. It was a lot of fun. We all had a big laugh over it. I didn't. I was triggered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really cute. So, should we talk about the rules a little bit and what we liked and didn't like? Uh, so, is there anything in the rules that you rather liked? Things I liked in the rules. I, I think there were two things I re- that really stood out that I thought were good ideas. Um, one was actually in character creation. So one of the things they do to bind your group together, because essentially you don't belong to a faction. You, um, you have pros and cons with a faction, but um, you don't belong to one. So in order to bring all your vagabonds together, during character creation, you have this relationship between two of the other player characters. And I thought that was a really neat way to bind the players together in an interesting way. It isn't just that, um, uh, you know, you met this possum um, in in your hometown and you guys uh, played marbles together and now you're best friends. It actually had a little bit more weight to that. And there were some game mechanics built into that relationship. So I thought that was really cool. Like if the uh, you had one relationship where um, that other player character if they helped you you get a plus one to some action so things like that i thought were really good that way you have a reason for all these vagabonds being together and they just aren't likely to run off on their own um and split the party which is a big pain in the butt for a game master so i thought that was pretty cool the other thing is just the that core component of the game mechanics of building everything off of moves there's pros and cons to it but the one pro to it was that it forced you to get into role playing more than I think things like Dungeons and Dragons where you might just use some skill mechanic to achieve a particular thing like I'm going to do an intimidation role or I'm going to do blah 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 when you do a move you sort of describe what you're doing in the move yeah you could do it with Dungeons and Dragons but it just felt like this kind of game mechanic forced you to discuss what you're going to do and then select the move. Like, this is the move I'm going to do. How can I couch that move in this particular um, part of the game, this scene? So those are the two things I liked in the game mechanics. So, yeah, just to be clear, um, the game uses, they basically have two different charts. One is basic moves, which there's literally only eight moves. So this is what I would, I look at it broken into two different segments. One is your role playing or your interaction with um, your environment or NPCs. And then the other one are called weapon moves. That's a whole nother sheet. Um, And again, everything is called moves. So for instance, they are very vague. Um, One is per se, per se, persuade NPC. So you either roll for a success or not. And of course this game relies heavily on the GM telling you the results of things. Um, Another one of these um, basic moves is attempt roguish feats. That's all it says. There's no pick lock. There's no stealth. There's no skill for you think of a typical thief and most fantasy or any role playing game. But this one just says attempt roguish feats feats and it's based on your finesse and you just wing it from there it's very very basic it's very easy to understand the game master never rolls dice the only person that rolls dice is the character trying to do something you can even trust fate for anything and that means you roll against your luck um and again there's successes partial success is seven to nine um a good i guess extraordinary success is ten and above and typically you have things you can pick from a list. Um, and then below that's a failure, which again, the game master has to define how, how you failed and what the results were. Um, again, there's only eight basic moves in your everyday interacting with your environment, except for combat. What about you, John? Was there any rules that you particularly liked? 
don't know. I found it kind of interesting that, you know, things were kind of set or very preset, I guess. Uh, it was it was neat how, you know, the GM doesn't roll any die. Everything is based on, is I mean, basically your your role has, uh, you know, your attack and the uh, your opponent's kind of attack built in. Uh, so I mean, I think it's really kind of interesting. Uh, I think basically it makes the GM be more of a. Uh, to actually do more role playing than the characters do, because they have to kind of fill in everything constantly. It's not just you know here's here's the world and and you know let you interact in it. But they have to then um, kind of be the counterpoint to everything constantly based on your role. So, which I thought was interesting, and I think it can make it more enjoyable for a, a GM if they like to be more interactive in things. So, I mean, I think it's it's a really interesting system. I mean, I haven't played anything like that. I mean, usually everything is kind of this, you know, back and forth kind of thing. But, uh, but yeah, it was, I, I, I thought it was really kind of neat. I mean, when I originally did this, uh, you know, this is the one that I chose when we were talking about, you know, different games to possibly play. I just kind of come across it and I thought, you know, the setting's kind of neat. It sounds cute. <clears throat> That's literally what went through my head. I didn't really have much time to, to look at the rules, to, to get a real feel for them. But I thought, it's cute. What the heck, you know? I'll, I'll put this one out there. And all of you guys, I, I think it was like the number one thing that everyone wanted to try and play. And I was kind of like, really? Oh, okay. You know, so... But it's I because it's so different. Very interesting and stuff. It was kind of neat to get into. I think the only issue we really had was it felt like we didn't have enough. There was some stuff missing that we didn't really have. That we had questions. We're like, well, well what about this? Well, we we don't know. We'll just assume it's this way, and then well, that's how we rolled. So, but I thought it was very neat. It was really interesting rules. Yeah, the setting was my favorite part because it 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 suggested we play differently less serious less you know it was all kind of fluffy if i may make an inadvertent pun you know that i enjoyed about it so the other moves that we were talking about and we touched on just now are the weapon moves now this is essentially combat really you only have as far as i can tell you only have three moves in combat that you would need to roll for and they are engage sword to sword, grapple on the enemy, or target someone. Uh, then you have special moves. Every character class has a special move. In my case, I had cleave. I used it once because every time you use a special move, you have to mark off an exhaustion point. I found that to be not very useful. Now, one thing I didn't like uh, was engage sword to sword. Like It took us a little bit to understand because this is a new game for us, you know, the first creature I'm attacking doesn't have a sword. So we're, we're looking at the rules and it says engage sword to sword because I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to hit it with my sword, which is what I usually do. And, um, you know, he's like, well, it doesn't have, it really should be labeled melee combat or close range combat or something saying engage sword to sword. It took us a moment, just reading everything to understand that the, the rules, it means melee attack. Um, another thing I found odd was um, they, instead of calling it ranged attack, they call it target someone. I mean, when I hear target someone, I'm thinking, okay, I could target someone with my sword. Like I want to target a particular, you know, foe or target maybe a head or a limb or something, but no target someone means a ranged attack. Now the, the weird thing about combat is when you engage sword to sword, again, that's melee attack, you roll for, you roll 2d6, and one to six is a miss, and seven to nine, you get to pick one from a list, which is you inflict serious harm, you suffer little harm, you shift your range from intimate to far, or you impress, dismay, or frighten your foe. Now, if you roll a 10 or more, you pick three of those from the chart. So let's say I successfully hit in this combat. 
but I only rolled a seven to nine. That means that I can pick either take little harm or to suffer serious harm. Well, if I choose to inflict serious harm, I'm going to take a wound because remember the game master never rolls. So your combat is resolved by your choices and your roles and your in your injuries come from your choices and your roles. The DM, the game master only lets you know what the results of those things are. And with ranged attack target someone, for instance, I see nothing there. There nothing bad can happen to you in ranged attack. For instance, if I'm using a bow, there's no thing in the rules for the enemy is using a bow against me. I didn't see where there was any kind of ranged attack against the player characters, unless I missed something there. Jimmy, do you know? That was actually when Frank was going to get around to the cons. <laughs> that was going to be my biggest con. Oh, well, I didn't. I didn't. I think we're kind of there now. I was just trying to explain the combat system because basic, you have basic moves. This is the whole meat of the game. You have basic moves, interacting with your environment and role playing, and then weapon moves. And both very, very simple. Yeah, I think. Um, so, powered by the Apocalypse Engine, that's what they call it. Um, it started with a game called Apocalypse World. And they came up with this game mechanics. So first of all, the naming that you you didn't like, they have um, in Apocalypse World, for example, the combat move, like the sword to sword combat that we have in Root, they call it Seize by Force, um, mainly because in Apocalypse World, it's all about resource acquisition. And then they have another really popular, probably the second most popular game that uses that game engine is called Dungeon World. And they call it hack and slash. But it's based on the setting, so those success, partial success, and failures are unique to whatever game setting that you're playing. So in Root, you know, you have those partial successes where you trade harm, you limit the harm you receive or cause serious harm with um, your opponent. Those breakdowns would be different from game to game to game based on what the setting is. So I guess the naming is, yeah, maybe a little, could be a little better for um, Root, but I, that's just what the game designers for the Root setting decided to go with. Right. Well, and again, I mean, it didn't take us long to figure it out because the game system is very simple. I mean, for me, I love simple game systems, uh, combat in particular, because I hate for a game to get bogged down in a big combat thing i mean that's fine i know a lot of people love to role play and play it that way you know miniatures rules and that sort of thing and that's what they like they like you know the the combat and the tactical moves and all that but for me most of my games that i enjoy the most are very story driven which means there's a lot more interaction with npcs and i mean everybody wants a little combat you got to have some action there but i like it to be resolved fairly quickly I don't know. I mean, I'm interested in what your thoughts were as running this game, like the combat part in particular. Like what, as a game master, how did you feel like you were able to um, you know, relay the story? Did you find it limiting or did you find it liberating? I mean, what, what were your thoughts on that in particular? So in terms of uh, running the game, Telling the story was pretty easy and straightforward. The only problem I came into was that my other, my really one big con, which is probably because I don't understand how to execute it. Maybe it would help to spend some time watching gameplay of other games that use this similar, the, the, the Powered by Apocalypse Engine. Because I don't ever roll. I mean, that was really hard for me to wrap my mind around. And I don't know, like the ranged combat i didn't know how to make that threatening for frank's character who used a rock <laughs> to uh to attack the the main bad boss at the end there there was he was out of range there was nothing i could do really i guess i could have come up with something that would have been a negative for frank's character um, with a ranged attack but i wasn't sure how you would implement that given the rules so i think there's something i'm missing from a, the game master side on how to implement the combat in a more engaging way. It just felt I, like it, I, I couldn't engage so. in combat. 
I, Maybe I don't, not. I don't but... see that at all. I mean, well, I'm looking a... at the rules right now, and that there you basically have the three basic moves for weapon moves, and then your special hits, and that's well, it. I'd be interested to see what other game masters do for range combat, for example, when using this these game mechanics, because you don't have to follow the rules 100%. So maybe there are add-on rules or ways that the game masters implement that particular part of the game differently from how the rules are written. So I don't know. I just With three sessions, we weren't able to get into it, like John said, to a great deal of depth. And seeing how it's our first time with this particular set of rules um there's going to be a lot we miss particularly given that it's not a full game it's just a quick start for right, a game that right. still and has there may yet be to other be released weapon moves. you're absolutely right so we got to wait on that front but all in all you know even with the cons i liked it in some ways i kind of felt like it it was almost a beta quick start like they haven't worked through all the nuances and details and things like this are helping them refine that. I could be wrong, but that was just the impression I got is that it, 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 it feels like it's history, which is from a board game where you've got like a card that does a thing or another card that does a thing. And it has very definitive actions on the board game, which don't translate perfectly well to a role-playing setting. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, it came out in, I think the quick start rules came out in 2019. I could be wrong. I know the Kickstarter is about a year old and they still haven't released the, um, they're a pre-order right now, but they haven't released any other materials other than the quick start. So, I, you know, I think we still got some time to go on that. Well, I know that Blades in the Dark, which is the game that I had picked, it has a similar mechanic in that the Game Master doesn't roll. The Game Master simply responds to what's going on with the help of the players. And I think that maybe this is a uh, an evolution of gaming mechanics that we haven't worked through enough because this is very, it's fundamentally different than how we have gamed in the past where there's a rule and a consequence and a rule and a consequence. Uh, so that may be a bit tricky. Yeah, I think the, uh, I'm kind of wondering if it's one of these things where kind of like what I said before was it feels that the GM is supposed to do more role-playing themselves. There's they're supposed to be more interaction with them instead of just kind of <clears throat> throwing out scenarios in front of you, but now they have to really engage more in terms of... not. And I'm not saying that GMs don't do anything. I mean, usually their, their side of things are kind of very dry. You mean GMs don't do anything? Come on, man. That's exactly what I said. I'm not saying it's that GM they don't heyday. do anything. No, that's exactly what I'm saying. I, I think the problem is is that that people have played and thought, man, it'd be nice if the GM got to do more, something more enjoyable, be more interactive in the game rather than just, you know, dropping hints and dropping a monster in front of you and reading off of a table and go, oh, you did so much damage or whatever. I think it's a way to have the GMs engage in a more creative way. I, th I think this might be one of these these aspects that younger gamers are kind of maybe pushing into how us old people just go, oh, the GM job sucks, and that's the way it's going to be. And, you know, GMs in my day, they got to cry themselves to sleep at night you know, <laughs> because things suck or whatever. And so the idea is that maybe they're, they're wanting to have it so that the GM is more... Uh, more like a player and so it's that, that the whole the whole experience for everyone gm included is more interactive so that uh gms don't get as bored uh you know that they're not basically just reading off of tables and saying you hit or you missed or whatever so that everyone's kind of interactive because everyone knows oh i rolled 10 i get to you know i get to pick these three things and, and basically the GM is, uh, is less involved in, you know, just table crunching and more involved in storyline and, and describing things. It's, I don't know, just an interesting idea. 
Yeah, I think um, I was talking to Jack, and he's my son. He's 18. He's been playing a lot of different games. Um, It's funny. I asked him if he'd ever played Root, and he said, no, all my friends, uh, when I mentioned it, because I knew you guys were playing, said, what are you, some kind of furry? And I was like, what's that mean? And apparently furries are people who dress up like like animals and stuff and wear, and wear all kinds of weird clothing and stuff. So I now know what a furry is. And I wonder... <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Jack hasn't played that. But he did say that it sounds a little bit more like Fate, the Fate system, which he's played, which doesn't rely heavily on dice as much as other games, is my understanding. I've never played a Fate system. Mara, have you played a Fate system before? In just basic terms, yes. It, does it rely heavily on the dice, or is it... No, no, it's... it. it the majority of people that I know that played the face system played an adaptation of rock, paper, scissors. And so <laughs> what? that was, yeah. Is, is that like success, partial success, failure or Pretty just much. success, failure? I guess it's rock, paper. What if you have like 12 people playing rock, paper, scissors in your game setting? It's awkward. And sometimes <laughs> there are nerf items that are thrown <laughs> I now I want to play Fate. <laughs> Nerf items? How's that work in a remote setting? It does not. <laughs> so, in case any listeners are wondering why we haven't heard from Steve since the beginning, is uh, he lost his internet connection? So that's why he's been so silent for the past twenty, thirty minutes, or whatever we've been talking about. Root. So we've we've covered the basic moves and some of those things. Uh, we really haven't talked about special moves yet, uh, but what was your perspective on playing Root, Stephen? So I don't know if my perception of Root is positive because of the system or just positive because of Jimmy's DMing. Uh, it made me feel like I was being led by an excited chipmunk. So <laughs> that's that's pretty it, accurate. Yeah, yeah. It was it was oh no, look over here, look over here. I got nuts over here. You want to see? Over here. Go over here. That's good. And so that was that was a good time. I we got to kind of touch on all the little pieces of the the game. Um I think character creation is cool. I think for people who are especially younger that this is great. This would have been a great first game to introduce my daughters to. Uh, I do like the fact that in the higher level moves, there are things like murder. <laughs> Which you utilized to great effect. <laughs> On a restrained a mouse. <laughs> he wanted Poor to mouse. die. He did. And you probably just relieved all of his pain. Though, you know, if you would have let him live, you could have saved him. <laughs> I, I but tell what you kind that of life now. would he have <laughs> led? What kind of life? Have I mean, you ever really? seen a three-legged dog? They do just fine. And an anthropomorphic, uh, you know, mouse? Hey, what's one arm? Maybe it was his good arm. Of course, he would have had a colostomy bag for, you know, the rest of his life. <laughs> that little bucket that you kicked over. Oh, that's the scent. That nice. was the scent of pee and liquid poop. Little liquid mouse poop. I take but it yeah. back. I had a terrible time. What? <laughs> it was an awful adventure. I didn't know there was a colostomy bag involved. That changes everything. Well, is that more like a jar? <laughs> it's low tech. Yeah, so uh, I I agree. I think the I, it's so rules light, right? There's not a lot of game mechanics to it. So with D and D, you got like a gazillion different rules and a billion different spells, and there's a lot of things that can. It's got a lot of depth, but then you get bogged down by a lot of the rules. Like if you're going to cast a spell, almost inevitably, I'm looking up the spell to see what it actually does and how it's being used and how many people it targets, how, what the area is, blah, 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 blah. With this, you don't have any of that. You have really simple moves. 
and you just have a couple of them, right, per class. And then you have your basic moves. Everybody has uh, the base access to the basic moves, but there's only like six or seven of them. So you don't have a lot to work with here. So it's mostly just role playing, which was very freeing, but also frustrating <laughs> coming from the old school role playing stuff. I think it's geared much more toward role playing than combat for sure. And, and I think it's a great game to introduce anyone, not just younger people, to role playing games. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, but then on the other hand, you have you know things like the murder skill. Uh, you know, you're going to introduce a nine year old to that. I mean, I, I don't know that it's necessarily geared toward children. Do you, do you know, see what I'm, see what I'm saying? Unless you wanted to pare it down just a little bit. I don't think it's fuzzy animals and stuff. I think that's kind of where you kind of go with the you know kids aspect of it. But yeah, the murder doesn't doesn't really come into that too well. I just want to say that Steve-O, uh, Nick was watching Psycho when he was seven. So I'm just saying, maybe it just depends on the parrot. Uh, well, you know, it's not my fault he became a serial killer. <laughs> And he's so much fun to hang out with. So are there any other aspects of Root that you think we haven't covered here that we need to cover? Well, what did you think about it, Frank? What was your pros and cons? Did you have any sense of, like, uh, whether you liked it or didn't? I don't have any really thing to add to this. I mean, we've covered, from my perspective, almost everything uh, fully. And I think that I generally agree with everyone else that uh, it... Uh, it lacks definition in the edges and this presented problems for me. Um, and I don't know if those are problems because the game has problems, problems because things are evolving in a direction that I'm not familiar with and I need to evolve. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. That's, that's exactly how I feel about it. Perfectly summed up for me as well. I just, would you be willing to play another one? I don't know that I want to play another root game, but maybe... The thing, I liked the, the thing I liked most that I've not seen, I think the setting forced this, uh, is, again, that, and, and I, I don't know how to say this other than fuzziness, the warm fuzziness uh, that that we all brought to it. It was a lightheartedness, and that, that was very refreshing and fun for me. That was the best part of it by far. There's absolutely nothing inherent in Dungeons and Dragons that keeps you from doing that. There's absolutely nothing inherent in Traveler that keeps you from doing that. However, it just was easier with this. And I don't, so in that sense, to get that uh, feeling, it was like eating a pudding cup. You know, I mean, it's not like it's the only form of food that I ever want to eat, but occasionally it's nice to eat a pudding cup. <laughs> yeah. I had that, I had a big problem nice as a analogy. game master. Yeah. I had a, I think I need way more time with it. I mean, even as simple as it is, part of it is it's so alien. So I need more time because I never really utilized, or you guys never really utilized your relationships. Because like I said, there's a game mechanic built into the relationships. So we never really did that. And I, I still don't have a really strong sense of the combat rules like we were talking about. So I think, I think I'd like to do the rule system maybe in another setting. So maybe in the future we'll do the apocalypse world and let John run it so I can play because uh, I know he likes that kind of thing. Of course, he might want to play it, so I don't know. And then Dungeon World might be another interesting one to try. I don't know. Maybe we should try this again in the future just to get a better sense of it, either with a different game setting or another root game further down the line once it's fully out. I am curious. I, I don't. I didn't do any research on this. I don't know if anyone else did, but I know that you know Dungeons and Dragons and Traveler and, and Coliseum and all those games that have been around forever and a day. There's a bazillion message boards out there where people argue about the nuances interpretation of this rule versus that rule. And I'm kind of curious if there's any community like on Reddit or something like that around Root that maybe they they've discussed has through this stuff and we could have could tap into it a little harder to say, oh, this is what this means, and this is how you should do that. Yeah, let me, I know there were several game plays that they recommended, and um, the one place we need to point everybody to is Magpie Game has a root page, specific root page, and I'll leave that in the chapter notes, but that's a really good place to go and check out, first, all of the products that they have available, 
and also they have links to gameplay and other assets, including the Quick Start on Drive-Thru RPG. The link is there. So everything you want to know about Root pretty much you can find on that one page at Magpie Games, as well as you can subscribe to get updates for when they actually release the game. Uh, and you, if you want to, you can just go ahead and pre-order it, and you know, you'll get a notification that way as well when it's shipped. So I have one one question for everybody as players, from a game master to a player. So just to recap the entire game, essentially what it was is you had this crazy squirrel who created the who got hit by lightning, went a little nuts, <laughs> pun intended, and then he created this big monster thing, went off into the forest, and he was capturing it was a mechanical monster it was part our organic and part mechanical he was a tinkerer and a cyborg yeah and he basically created a cyborg by harvesting the little critters from this outpost uh, sneaking in once a week to grab somebody new and pull it out into his uh, secret lab in the woods away from the town and he would make this big monster so that was essentially the overarching story. What was your favorite moment in the game? Uh, start with John. I don't. I mean, the uh, the possum thing was pretty funny. I'll admit that was that was kind of amusing. I don't know. Coming across the kind of clockwork denizens in the basement was, you know, kind of neat. Right. So they we were... had a clockwork kind of uh, cat that attacked yeah, them with. Uh, yeah drill bit thing in their chest or whatever that was cool you know, what about that, you that frank really kind of neat uh, the possum yeah we already uh, talked about what that uh, steve-o told us about that earlier mara what was your favorite moment i did like the one scene in the basement with the poor <laughs> sad mouse and the stinky fluids and the fact that the first thing I really get to do when I come in, because I missed the first session, is murder somebody, which <laughs> is something I don't normally do. I was horrified. <laughs> and I, I had like my first Kevorkian moment where I was doing a mercy <laughs> killing, but but it felt it felt kind and it felt sweet and it felt, you know, right. I did like the way you hugged him before you yeah. stabbed him. <laughs> well, well, it was different than the whole, you know, furry kind of cuteness that you think you're getting into with Root. You know, this kind of diabolical, you know, well, half-dead, you know, mechanical horrors. Well, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And uh, Steve-O, what was your favorite moment? Well, it would be a toss-up between the possum playing possum, uh, very funny, uh, or it could be whenever... What was your character class, Frank? Uh, he's, he's va a vagrant? or Vagrant. Yeah. Yeah, so the vagrant who happened to be a drunk and sipped on wine all the time, uh, whenever we found a box of potions, decided to just start upending them and see what would happen. So whenever the vagrant started, uh, what was it? Potion it was vitality. a vitality. We found yeah. out later that he mixed with something else and was kind of ODing uh, all over the place. That was pretty fun. I like that. But maybe when I got blown up at the very end by the suicide <laughs> bomber uh, and lost a paw, <laughs> <laughs> that's a very memorable moment as well. So ba Badger can't dig anymore. Yeah, you know, not effectively. I can still dig. I think I had the tinker make me some kind of uh, mechanical implement. arm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think that's pretty much it for root. Um, at least for now. Maybe we'll play it again, hit it up again once the full rule sets out. I'd be okay with that. The production value on it is great. The writing is great. The way everything is laid out is great. It made me to go back and watch the animated Disney Robin Hood. I played that music in the background for myself while we played. And that was awesome. it, it was great. It, it has a good feeling. Everything is laid out quite nicely in the quick start. You know, there wasn't a lot that we really, really stumbled over. 
there were a couple of things like the uh, success or failure on the roll that's like really high lit in one particular place. So we all kind of stumbled over that. And, you know, figuring out the, the connection between special moves and weapons. And, you know, well, well, okay, if I start off as a tinker, I get a hammer. But one of the options is that I can take murder as weapon move. So that was a little bit of a problem. So there are little things like that that, you know, were, were little hiccups. But from other games that I've tried to play from first publication, I think that this is really, really nice. And I don't think it's necessarily made for kids, but it is the type of setting that is very accessible to younger children. And I, I would have loved to have DM'd, like I said, my, my daughters with this as their first introduction into role-playing. So, you know, murder or not. Well, right, because, I mean, role-playing games, regardless, uh, typically have uh, combat and gruesomeness and all that, for sure. Okay, so that's our little introduction to Root. And like Jimmy said, maybe we'll touch back on it later if we get a chance to play again in the future. Uh, Steve-O? Yeah, I just have one final thought. Um, you know, if if I had a, a lot of fun playing the game, it's exactly like you said, Frank, because of the setting, because we're playing woodland animals and all that kind of stuff, it was uh it just created an atmosphere of 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 very lightheartedness, you know. Um so it made it a lot you know, just everyone was having a good time with that. I would say to anyone listening to this you go download the quick start rules and the adventure pick somebody to run it and try it out for yourself because i do know we did three sessions with it which we probably could have got it done in a couple of sessions it was a lot of fun i don't know the sustainability for me to continue playing this game but actually in probably three or four months if jimmy or frank or john or steven said hey man i've got an idea for the root game do you guys want to play i'd probably play i mean it, it was fun uh, I don't know that I'd want to play it every week, but I definitely, every two or three months, I'd, I'd do a couple sessions. It was a, it was a really fun game. Yep. Ditto. Agreed. Any, other fi- any other final thoughts? I mean, I think if we had a really good, you know, um, a good adventure lined out that, that maybe kind of went more into the the background of the game, you know, like dealing with the Cat de Marquise or whatever, you know, the different factions uh, right dealing with some of the factions and things or uh you know get a little bit more in the dirt as you will it might be really and it might, it might be really enjoyable uh, so yeah when uh, i was picking out a one shot um i purposefully stayed away from that kind of stuff and even limited the um there was one place that i had where you guys met the mayor where I was supposed to do a uh reputation role and that's where the factions come into play and i wanted to test out that mechanic and completely forgot about it because you guys were making me laugh but as happens quite often in games so yeah if we did that i think that's more geared toward a campaign i i know you can do a one shot with it but it's a little hard for me to think in those terms and get more in depth with the factions and the broader community it'd be a little hard for me to figure out a way to ease us into that it can be done without a doubt but that's something maybe to think about the next time we create a root game which i think we probably should do once the full rule sets out okay so if you have any questions or comments about root uh please feel free to hit us up in the contact information coming on in a second uh also want to remind everyone to like and subscribe and bell and thumbs up and whatever it is you do rate on whatever it is platform you listen to this podcast that helps us out a lot that's all we have for this week thanks for spending time with us please leave a review and comments wherever you listen it helps others find the show If you have topic suggestions or would like to get in touch, you can reach us at roleplaygeeks at roleplaygeeks.com. Head on over to the website for an archive of all our previous shows, as well as links to all our social media channels. Thanks again, and we'll catch you next week. No one is ready, Mr. I just hit the record button. So hopefully... We are recording and everything will come out. What the hell was that? Can't breathe. Oh, it sounded like sounded like a giraffe with a sneeze.
Don't ask me Can why I get... picked a giraffe. I don't know. Should, we... Should I start? Yes. 